we will be having a conversation with the uh, Nyeri Town MP Ngunjiri Wambogo shortly as he uh, joins us on the line. Um, <clears throat> but there's still a lot that um, is happening and has been covered in, in, in the papers. For example, The Nation, page two. Uh, is it page two? That is page three. That is uh, giving the story. Remember there was an inquest and the... A court came up with a result, a report, and said, "No, no, there was no foul play in the death of the former cabinet minister, former minister, yes, and Mutula Kilonzo, and Makueni senator, right?" Mm -hmm. um, so today it's looking at like why court ruled out homicide in Mutula death. Uh, the family led by Mutula Kilonzo Jr. has been saying, "No, no, 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 there was foul play," and then there was massive cover up in this, and that's what they were saying at the inquest. Now. The 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 story here says gives the information that was taken to court and what they're saying led to the judge saying I actually don't see any foul play. Here it looks like a man who went home in the evening. Um, somebody went and bought a kilo of meat at a nearby butchery. He came. Uh, he took some um, antihistamine, and this antihistamine is known to have very strong uh, reaction. And then he took an, an antihistamine and what else? Some energy drink. Mm. And this combination is likely to have led to his, his death. death. No foul play <coughs> at all detec detected. Mm. Not in how he had spent his day. Not in um, uh, the manner in which he died. Not in the way his body was found. Nothing that really leads us to think that there was foul play. You this know, closes the chapter. Mm -hmm. But I consider mm. this again is something that seems to be ingrained in our minds. Yeah? Mm. People don't just die. And if they're in positions of leadership, if they're in positions of prominent leadership, yeah. then they certainly just don't die. There must be something untoward attributed to their passing away. Mm. Mm. Again, perception. It's a perception that our people have. Huh. Mm. It's like, how could he die? It's not possible for him to die. Yet we all know we must die. At some point. Hmm. It is a surety of life. Yes. We must end there sometime, uh, somewhere. And reason will be found to support those views because mm. he took this position, he offended such and such a person, mm. he offended the government. Usually something will be found to justify that particular perspective. Yep. He was justice minister in the Grand Coalition. Then At this time, there were investigations... Uh, into what had happened in 2008, um, all manner of uh, speculation mm. comes up. If someone, say, for instance, is represents the opposition wing in in, in the country, mm. then they certainly cannot just die. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. The government will be blamed for everything. For everything. Yes. Even if there's no government, he'll have political enemies. I mean, and the list just goes on and on and on. Anyway, so we've been talking the last couple of days about are political leaders mm. and questioning these guys. Do they have Wajiku at heart? When we see the government borrowing money left, right and center, we had a conversation early in the week about uh, national debt. Uh, the other day, we were, the, the Business Daily headline was looking at how much the country has borrowed in the last seven years. You know, over five trillion shillings within the last seven years alone, right? Mm. And where our debt is right now. And then you ask yourself, so where has this money gone? Has it actually gone to bear fruit? Uh, where are the citizens' watchdogs? The citizen watch watchdogs are uh, Parliament. Where has Parliament been as this happens? We see the Parliamentary Budget Office report coming out, for example, on some of these projects that have been initiated by the government. Uh, say, for instance, the big uh, projects in the manufacturing part of the Big Four agenda. We're looking at the Kanani Leather Factory. We're looking at uh, the Dongokundu Industrial Park, the Naivasha Industrial Park as well. And the Parliamentary Budget Office saying some of these projects, money come, I mean, the budget is brought to Parliament. Uh, money has been uh, allocated to this particular project. The uh, relevant committees look and they approve. The entire Parliament approves this budget. Money is not appropriated into this um, particular project. Supplementary budget a couple of months later is brought from the Treasury and that money has then now been moved from the initial intended purpose. So you end up having a project on paper, but on the ground, this project is not getting funding. 
Where have the members of parliament been? Look at the fight against COVID-19 and what we've raised questions here about uh, where has the money come from? Where has the money gone? Uh, do we need to have an audit of the decision-making process? Look at uh, the Kemsa scandal right now and very many others. Floods and the ravages of floods across the country and what floods have killed more people than COVID-19 mm. this year. Mm. But where are our elected representatives? Do they think about that? What do we hear about from them? Oh, now it's about Bibia, it's about uh, Tanga Tanga, it's about Kieleweke. Polit politicians' personal interest versus public interest. Mm. What comes where? Actually, it's political interest versus political interest. Mm. At what point does the common monetary feature? Feature in in any of these interests? No, it's their interest versus yeah. their other interests. And then, yes, when you think that when, uh, the, the monetary may come into the discussion, mm. some other political interest comes into the discussion. Mm. And the irony of all of this is that political um, leaders are actually there to represent the best interests of the people. That's the irony in all of this. Mm. But then they are the forgotten factor in most cases yeah. when it comes to the discourse that we hear then between political leaders that people, individuals, Kenya, Wanainchi, Wanjiko are forgotten. No, the, the discussion actually got to a point. This is it's like it, it went through an evolutionary process and arrived at maturation that so long as you represent the people, your interest has to be the interest of the people. Mm. Mm. Yes. Just by extension of the fact, but by virtue of the fact that you are the leader, the chosen leader, you represent the people. Mm. Irrespective of how ridiculous the particular notion of discussion may be, yeah, but you still represent, you still represent, still represent the people. Represent yes. Let's bring in one of the people's representatives, and this is the Nyeri Town MP, Ngunjiri Wambogo. Good morning, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning, Eric. How are you? Very well, thank you. Welcome okay. to the Situation Room. My colleagues Ndu Oko and C.T. Muga say hello to you. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Uh, Gujeri, we are today discussing what, what C.T. is saying, political interest versus political interest. Or let's just say politicians' interest versus public interest. And um, it's born out of what we've been discussing the last couple of months. Looking at what's happening to the people on the ground, looking at what politicians are focusing as their main uh, discussion at their plat in their platforms. So, for instance, um, COVID-19 has come. Many people have lost their jobs. Many have lost their livelihoods. Many have closed businesses. Many have had to really change their lifestyles because of the impact of COVID-19 on the economy, on their lives. What do we hear from politicians? Not about the, that impact, really but about other uh, things that are happening in the country. It's about insulting people's mothers. It's about talking about what uh, we're going to do with BBI come the next few days. It's about how we're going to flatten each other's curves come 2022. It's about how we are not going to allow this county lose or we are not going to allow this group of people win. Where does that feature in what you are elected to do, which is represent the people and have the people's best interest at heart? Um, Eric, I think the first thing we need to understand is that politicians are in office because they have been put in office by the public. Um, and the reason... So a lot of the things... Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Let me get that. Let me start all over again. Please You've talked about politicians, politicians' interest versus public interest, for example. Yep. It's, it's an interesting statement, but it's actually very theoretical, in my opinion. Because the reason politicians are in office is because the members of the public put them there. The most important thing to a politician is to stay in office. And to stay in office, you have to have the public support to stay in office. So anything you do is driven by what you think is in public interest. Because you need the public to actually keep you in office. You need the public behind you. You need the public supporting you. A lot of the times I see people complaining about what politicians are doing. Politicians are some of the people with the greatest pulse on public, uh, on what is popular to the public. So you, if you have a politician doing something, it is because he actually thinks there's a certain group or a certain sector of the public that is going to support him to do it. For example, you've seen people insulting others. As those people insult others, as those politicians insult other politicians, there are members of the public around that politician clapping for him. 
because this is what the politician thinks these people actually want him to be doing. Uh, so when, when the conversation about what is in public interest versus what is in politicians' interest, politicians actually very rarely have interests. Their interests are driven by what they think their public or whoever they represent, uh, whoever they, they represent is, in, is interested in. So they play now, to what the gallery. Do, they always play to the gallery, unfortunately, or most politicians play to the gallery. So if you see a politician, for example, pushing the issue of the conversation of the BBI, it's because there's a certain interest group that he represents that is interested in that particular uh, topic or that particular issue. Um, so the reason why you have such a disconnect, especially between people who analyze politicians um, and the politicians themselves, is because politicians, like I am a, I'm an elected member of parliament from Nyeri. My work is to keep trying to figure out what do the Nyeri people want me to do or say. If I'm an elected member of parliament from Nandi, for example, or from Rift Valley at this moment in time, I'd be doing what I think my public wants me to do, which is to fight for William Ruto. Because William Ruto looks like he's been fought by the government. So I would be fighting back against the government because I want to make my public happy with me, because right now, the grief that they have is that our leader, who is William Ruto, has been fought. If I come from Central Province, or if I come from Nyanza, for example, I'd be doing what the, what the public wants me to do, because at this moment in time, the public wants me to support Raila Odinga, to support the government. So the, the one person who has a pulse, or a finger on the pulse of their public, is a politician. Because as a, you can't be a successful politician and be disconnected from your public. Let You'll me, go home very quickly. Uh, Mwishimiwa, thank you. Uh, I, I, I like the, th the, the thread and, and the trend of, of, of your argument, but let me ask this question. Are yes. we to say, therefore, that leadership has to do primarily with doing what people want? Or, if I may ask, does it have to do with what you know you ought to do that will eventually help people with a long-term view? Let's first start by a uh, distinction. Not every politician is a leader. Because, again, that's another mistake I see us making. We assume that because somebody has gotten elected that they automatically have become leaders. People get elected because they're popular, not because they're leaders. Now, hopefully, some of the people who get elected are actually leaders. <laughs> are we together? <laughs> okay. Because remember, so let's, when let's, people let's, are running for office, so let's go back to that point that of gets the election. Voted, when people are going yes. to vote... Are they yes. going to vote for leaders or are they going to vote for politicians? What is the purpose of voting? No. Actually, people vote for people who are popular. The problem, about our, the, 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 the problem in our politics is that we haven't actually defined why we vote people. I had a, I had a recent conversation. Let me just use an example. Are you saying that the people of Nyeri don't know why they voted you in, Mr. Gunjiri? If I'm to go by the that people of Nyeri me. voted me because I actually went to the, I went to the ground and I, I convinced them that I was a better candidate than any other candidate who was running against me. And I convinced them I was a better candidate in many ways. I told them the stuff I would do for them, the things I would ensure would happen. For example, one of the things I remember uh, making a commitment to the people of Nyeri is that I would actually in, uh, upgrade the education infrastructure, the public schools. We have a lot of public schools that are very old, and I would upgrade that, in, that education infrastructure. Now, that is not leadership. That is work. That is me going out and saying, we have 78 public schools. They're in a really bad state. I will make sure they get fixed. So what is now, leadership? When you get in, leadership is giving direction. It's being able to take hard decisions that are not necessarily popular. Very few politicians are able to stand against a popular position. I have had the benefit of doing that a couple of times. When I started by challenging uh, my colleagues in Jubilee, who are doing premature campaigns, I was not popular. It was not a popular position. But today, it looks back and I have people telling me that was leadership. Now, a lot of my colleagues were not willing to do that because it was not popular, despite the fact that it was leadership, because we needed to get Kenyans to understand this is not the time to be doing politics. We have four years to work, and then we can do politics again. So every time I said that, I was unpopular. I got attacked by my colleagues. They came to Nyeri did harambees, brought a lot of money to local uh, institutions in my place to fight me because I was saying something that was right but unpopular. Now, a lot of politicians will not do the right thing if it is unpopular. Mm. And leadership is actually doing the right thing. 
So just going by the argument that you that you preferred uh, that um, yes. a politician has a finger on the pulse and understands mm-hmm. exactly what the people want. Let's even st- start yes. with when you were starting the Kieleweke movement yes. and pushing the Kieleweke narrative, is it that yes. you, you had actually looked at the people of Nyeri and thought that what the people of Nyeri want to hear is mm-hmm. this Kieleweke narrative? First and foremost, I don't even know what you believe or what you understand the Kieleweke narrative is. And second, the I Kieleweke also narrative is anti tanga tanga. Let's just it's as no, simple as that. I see now that's the problem. <laughs> but that's what you've just said. You started a no, campaign. You, don't understand you started a campaign. To stop premature to... campaigns. There you go. Yes. And you see, let me tell you the second thing, Eric. Mm. I was not I never intended to start a movement. In fact, I read about it in the newspapers and I laugh. I wasn't trying to build fellowship. I wasn't trying to be popular. I was just saying something I believed was correct. Um, this was 2018. <laughs> let me let me let me be let me be honest. Mm. This is 20. We have just finished an election in 2017 October. That's when we got. That's when we finished the second repeat election. This is 2018. By the way, remember I started talking about against premature campaigns even before the handshake. So this is February 2018. We've started going around the country campaigning for William Ruto to be president in 2022. And the first thing I said, guys, this is wrong and it is going to get you in trouble. And you will understand what I'm saying, which is what Kielewek actually means. So now when you, this came, is out, get you, when you came out with those sentiments in public, were you doing it as fueled by what the people wanted you to say? Or were you doing this of your own personal leading conviction? Now, that's the difference between me and a lot of politicians. Because mm-hmm. I did it out of my personal leading conviction. Mm. It was not popular at all. In fact, if you notice, for the whole of 2018, I was in running battles, literally, with my colleague politicians, because they didn't like what I was saying. But I believed, and by the way, I was, I, I, the papers would write about the way it's a one-man show, it's a one, it's a lone, I'm, being a lo, I'm doing Lone Ranger tactics. My colleagues would actually make fun about the fact that I am the only one in my region who doesn't support the deputy president. And I told them, it does, it's not about supporting the deputy president, which is why I'm saying I was not trying to start a movement. Mm. Somehow, it actually built up into a movement, but for a long time, mine was a position. And I have never tried to start a movement. Mine was, this is my position. And I always say, I could be wrong. Mm. I am happy to be wrong. But if I have a conviction about something, for example, the same way right now I have a conviction about this Watufulani narrative, when I have a, I, I'm not trying to be popular. I'll stand up and speak. I have a platform. I'm an elected member of parliament. I don't know how long I'm going to be elected. But for as long as I'm in office, I will use this office to push these things that I believe are right. Mm. If you think they are wrong, I'm willing to argue about it with you. Until you prove to me that why I'm wrong, and I'm, if I'm wrong, and I'm going to accept I'm wrong. Okay, you talk about then being on the outside uh, in terms of popularity, and now if we're looking at leaders in general in this country, it seems that mm-hmm. when we hear things, it, this is what we perceive, and I say we on mm-hmm. the other side of leadership, right? We yeah. perceive that a lot of the things that are made public, in terms mm-hmm. of how leaders speak them, are not mm-hmm. necessarily at the heartbeat of the interests of Kenyans, but are things mm-hmm. that you feel will help you gain some political expediency or alignment that will be positive for you in the future. Would you say mm-hmm. that this is not the case? I, that's, again, I'll come back from a uh, uh, theoretical perspective. I'm a political scientist in terms of what I did in school. Mm. And the, one of the biggest problems we have is the connection between what we think is politically, it's political expediency when you're sitting somewhere in analyzing it and what actually the public wants. And let's use an example of Nairobi City, I mean Nairobi County. I keep hearing people complaining about the fact that uh, Sonko got elected. Mm-hmm. I have a feeling if he went to office, he went into an election today, he'll still get elected again. True. Mm-hmm. But we are here seated arguing about all the things that he's doing that don't make sense. But there's a population in this county that will actually come out and vote for him. So you ask yourself, you who is seated here thinking about the things Sonko is supposed to be doing, fixing roads, fixing our medical facilities, da, da, da. and then there's somebody out there who is happy with Sonko because he came out and rolled on the streets. Mm. And they think that is such a cool thing, they're going to elect him for it. Now, if you're a politician who just wants to get elected, you're going to look at the cool things. You're going to dress in a cool way. You sit down and remember, politicians actually are pretty smart. So when you're getting elected, the first thing you do is map out where your population is. Mm. 
So we're in a country where we say 75% of our population is young. Young people don't have a concrete expectation of leadership. What they want you to do is associate yourself with them. They want you to listen to their kind of music. They want you to dress like them. They want you to speak like them. If you can do those things, they will vote for you. Once they put you in office, and they will put you in office because they're going to vote for you against their parents. Mm. They're going to vote for you against older people who are more reasonable about the expectations of the leadership or the political leadership they want to elect. Once they put you in office, they have absolutely no expectation of what they want you to deliver. <laughs> Wait, Shimewa, don't you think that is really broadly speculative to actually state that this entire group of people who we consider youth don't really know what they want in the, the leadership? I would argue they do. Okay, but uh, that would be a good argument. But you tell me where it is that they have actually voted for someone based on an expectation. And I was going to give you an example of a conversation I had recently with the uh, members of the clergy in my, constitu- in my constituency. So we sat and they were pretty upset about the COVID rules and how they were affecting the church. And they tell me, look, I am, we are very unhappy. I'm a child of clergy. My dad is a retired clergy. And they telling me, you're a child of clergy. You understand the importance of church. Why aren't you standing out there and speaking against the things that are happening to church? And I asked them, I have been in office for two years, two and close to three years, okay, three years now. You all know me. You all know my family. At what point have you ever come and said, uh, Member of Parliament, a Member of Parliament, we want to sit down with you. This is what we want you to go and do for us. I asked them, even when I was getting elected, when we met, we didn't talk about, you didn't give me a to-do list. You put me in office because you knew my family, you knew my parents, and you knew I was going to be a good person. Now I'm in office. We are supposed to be having a conversation about this is what I, we as a sector, as a religious sector, want you to go and do for us. That's the meeting when they gave me a, uh, uh, an expectation. Mm. And they gave me a religious act that they want me to deliver on. Now they have something to judge me on. Before that, they didn't have anything to judge me on because we had never had an argument. Tell me how many voters have discussions with the people they're going to put in office about what those people, are, what that person is going to go and do for them. Tell me how many politicians campaign on an issue-based platform. Tell me how well, many I politicians do. challenge, aha, I am not talking about, the, you, you are an exception, sir. <laughs> I am I talking so. about the general trend of things in this country, even mm. with political yes. parties. When do they have issue-based, even campaigns, when? It's rubble but rousing, cloud pleasing. When? And so, actually, but also, now, that, CT, actually, yes. just to, yes. to go on that, I would say that, mm-hmm. um, strictly speaking, if you just to be very technical about it, mm. politicians campaign on uh, issues. Because Ngonjiri will go and he will try to convince the people of Nyeri, this is your need. Schools. I am going to upgrade the schools. Mm. All right? Mm. That is an issue. He has picked an issue that really uh, resonates with the people. And then he'll go to parliament and he'll start talking about Tanga Tanga Kieleweke. He'll start talking about other things. Uh, well, at the same time, let's hope that he actually goes and does something to deliver on the schools. So every politician, even Sonko, when he's rolling down on the road, he is promising something. He's saying, we are going to improve this city. We are going to bring markets here. Mm. We are going to bring a stadium here. We are going to ensure that these youth that don't have jobs have car washing businesses and other businesses that will open locally. So you see, there, there are some issues that they'll raise. There are issues, but it's a con. Mm. Why it's a con is because I believe, if I'm to go by the former, uh, the, the dictates of what the former... Uh, Prime Minister of Singapore said that one of the roles he believes a politician should have was to equalize opportunity. There are other things he said, but I'm, I'm focusing on this. Mm. When you talk about building schools because you have a constituency development fund, when you talk about building roads because you have monies that can do that, what are you telling the citizenry? Are you telling them that you are bringing goodies or are you telling them that you are doing your job? Uh, okay, no, for a moment I wasn't sure whether you're asking that to me or to Eric. <laughs> I have lumped, who, I've, I've lumped, I've lumped you and Eric in the same basket. <laughs> oh, you put me and Eric in the same basket. <laughs> okay. The first thing I wanted to exp- to first for us to understand is that 70% of members of parliament mm-hmm. or elected politicians go home every election. So one out, three out of ten people are the ones who get elected back. Mm. Now, when you're running for election the first time, you're running on promises. And promises are easy to make. Because you don't have 
you you, you have no uh, uh, what go you have no delivery position mm. i can tell you i'm going to make sure that in your you have milk coming out of your taps yep. mm. in your house <laughs> i mean i can promise you anything when i'm running for office great when you're getting reelected you're judged on delivery of the promises you made yep mm-hmm. which is why a lot of people don't come back mm-hmm. and that's now the problem about our politics that you don't even get held to account for the promises you're making before you get elected people are willing to literally buy anything you tell them as re- as unreasonable as it sounds but people will not ask you but that how are you how exactly are you going to do that mm-hmm. and one of the things i have found interesting is our political ma- manifestos especially as members of parliament or mcas or governors or senators mm-hmm. our political manifestos when you are selling yourself the first time are never audited by people nobody actually sits down and says these things you are promising to do we don't even have the kind of money you can do to do them yeah where are you going to well, actually not, be able to it's not even your, your mandate to do them yes So you're going to tell people I am going to make sure we have a b c d but that's not the role of a member of parliament but Let people me, are going to I buy can I ask you that when these things are being put out in the public do you as leaders when you're thinking as gunjiri yes. do you expect mm-hmm. the people of Kenya to come and ask you or to put you to task uh, or to hold you accountable do you expect that to happen across board Your question is an interesting uh, explanation of the problem we have hmm. because we are the people of Kenya including us mm. as leaders leaders are actually elected from within the people of Kenya so the person you have elected is just like you mm-hmm. so he went and he compared himself with five other people like him and felt he and was he the best said one. me and no he actually proved to the hundred of you who are voting that he's better than the other four mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because part of elections here is not part of politics in our country is not competing against a uh, ideal it is competing against the others so then in that position do you expect that your fellow people are going to ask you or hold you to account because again looking from it from this point of view it's that most leaders don't even expect kenyans to ask them or hold them ac- accountable don't expect Actually, to it's only in politics mm. it's only in politics it's only in politics, only in politics people don't that expect people do not expect to be held to account mm. I, i can have tell you another you profession conman But you see in con- that's there's no profession like that. <laughs> you see the only Actually, profession that exists where we pay people good money. This is good public money. Yep, yep. Uh, we give them good titles. We give them a good lifestyle. We allow them to come and sit at the front of every of every uh, every function. event you're having. Mm-hmm. Every function you're having, you actually allow you give them a position of prestige. Mm. And then you don't ask them questions. You know when like you see, I find that I find that so interesting. <laughs> It's very very interesting. The interesting points that you're raising here in Gujiri Mbogo is the member of parliament for Nyeri town. We are asking politicians interest versus public interest and where do those two meet if at all? When you're electing leaders in church, when you're electing the chairman of the board, when you're electing the treasurer of the church, when you're electing the representatives of the church, you really make a mistake. Even if your brother is running for office and you know he's a thief You're not going to elect him as a treasurer of your church. Yep. In fact, you're the one who's going to convince everybody else how he can't be. <laughs> And he doesn't give you money to do it. <laughs> But that if you for example, if you if you're putting together a fundraising committee to raise money for your local church or your local school or, or something or, or a friend who is unwell, mm. you actually put the right people in the right place. So we know how to do this except in politics. Well, if you look at the role of politics and the large space it occupies in our lives on a daily basis, yes. you really have to ask an additional question to what we are asking. Uh-huh. Do you think the general public is more likely to conform or are they likely to move towards the direction of nonconformity? I would say they are likely to conform. It's not that they're ignorant. Uh-huh. It uh-huh. is I'm saying the push to conformity. Uh, since he is a Mwishimiwa, it is okay. We have that tendency in our country because so and so has this particular position we will not tell him the truth we will not speak our minds we will conform and the politicians themselves because it is the leader of my party who has said this I will not oppose it I will conform because mm-hmm. uh, it is in my interest and this uh, 
ceiling that we are raising for our borrowing may also benefit me in some way, or we have uh, found a way of it benefiting us, we will continue with it and continually put the government into this ridiculous debt that they have. Conformity. Actually, no. I, so conformity is easy, but that person wasn't always a leader. So why are you conforming to him? And then number two, do you understand the responsibilities of your office? Because, for example, you've given a very good example about that borrowing. Part of the reason I will support the, the raising of the ceiling is because I understand how much money we actually spend as a country. Mm -hmm. So my decision is based on knowledge. Somebody else will support it based on the fact that the president actually said it. And because I support the president, I'm going to have to do it. Somebody will oppose it because I don't agree with anything the president does, because I come from the opposition, opposition party, so I cannot support anything, that, anything the president does because I'm a member of the opposition. So a lot of the reasons that, division, that politicians make decisions are based on other things. Now, we as, as the people need to put in office people who will make decisions based on conviction. And you all, that person doesn't start making decisions like those after you elect him. What sort of convictions? He has made those kind of decisions before. What sort of convictions? Eric, I, for example... No, I the, no this is Muga. Time. This is City Muga. Oh, this Muga. Okay. I was going to use an example of Eric. I've known Eric for a long time. Mm. I know the kind of person he is. So if I am looking for a particular... I have a particular slot of office, I will be able to judge whether he can fit into it or not based on who he is. Not based on what he tells me at that moment. Now, we have a situation where when we are running for office, you show up, people don't know you, and because you have a lot of money and you can run a really loud campaign, people will vote for you. After the dust has settled, they wake up and they don't even know who they voted for. Number two, we have a country that votes against people. So Eric was a member of parliament before. Mm. I asked him to do something for me. He refused. Mm. So in the next election, I mobilized against him. I'd rather vote for a dog than Eric. Exactly. So <laughs> after the death, dust is settled, I have sent Eric home. But I, in the space, because somebody had to get elected, some other guy who got into office, I have no idea what he stands for. Two years down the road, I realized the guy is a complete... Con. Disaster. Yep. <laughs> and I started complaining about him. And in three years, I vote against him. And I will keep doing that it's a cycle. every election. So the only person I know is the person I'm voting against. But don't you see there in that, the voter is actually mm -hmm. expressing their frustration. The voter is saying something. The fact that the voter the, kicks out 70% of these leaders is saying something. Every five exactly. years, a voter is mm -hmm. thinking, no, the last person that we had elected in Yeri Town did not yeah. serve us. Did not deliver. They, they did not deliver. No, we even forgot their promises. They just did not act like they were acting in our best interest of the people of Nyeri. Yes. And therefore, yes. that's why we want to listen to this other young man who is the mm -hmm. son of a pr preacher. And let's Pardon. give him this yes. opp opportunity. Yes. The young Why man you serves five uh -huh. years and he's yes. going, going back home and the people are looking at, did we feel like this person was representing us? Did we feel like this person actually um, had our best interest at heart? And if they feel that they didn't, they kick you out. They bring in somebody else. Exactly. Actually, sometimes they don't even think like that. Sometimes the, the decision will be that the last election, the member of parliament who was there was, had stayed for too long. We need to change. Or they're in a different <laughs> political party. Or they, or, or they were in the wrong party. Yeah. So we elect uh, this young man, uh, pretty decent looking guy, mm. sounds like he's intelligent, put him in office. But you didn't tell him what you want him to go and do for you. Mm. You, you see, like in, a, in, in, in first world uh, democracies, for example, you have a political action uh, caucuses. So that for me to get the support of the unions, I sit with the unions before elections. Right. And, we, and they challenge me. And they tell me this is what we want from government. Then I promise them I'll get it for you. Then I sit with the Pentecostals. And they tell me this is what we want from government. And I promise and I show them how I can get it for them. By the time I'm getting elected, I have, uh, a, to -do I have, expect, I have a to do list based on certain things. You have KPIs, for example, basically. Yes. So I go into office, and at the end of five years, the union, when I'm going back to them to ask them to support me, I will be looking at, this is what you'd asked me to do. You gave me ten things. I have delivered on seven. Or I have delivered on six. Mm. Now, in this country, we don't do that. Why? We never... 
part of it is because it's never been it's not part of our political culture why can't it be actually I don't think it's part of political interest, if I can go that far as saying that. No, 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 no. But is it really in the interest of politicians to have this done? Because then you would want to ask, then is it in the interest of people for why politicians are getting into office in the first place? You see, the reason, the problem I have with a lot of this argument, because it's a public, it's a, it's a popular argument. What you are pushing with me is a popular argument that it is the fault of the politician that you are in this trouble. No, 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 no. Politicians, let me explain that. Sorry, let me explain that. Politicians take the lowest common denominator. They take the lowest hanging fruit. If you do not give me a challenge, I will go with whatever you give me. Because what I want to do is get into office. So if you are not going to give me a standard to follow, I will not follow it. Okay. So if you give let's... me a standard to follow, yep. then the people who fit that standard mm. are the ones who will fit, who okay. will compete. So, if so for example, be, if, if we agree, mm. I need a degree, for example. Yeah. If we agree that I must have a degree to run for office, then only people with degrees will run for office. Mm. But so, if we don't have that kind of expectation, then anybody... And I'm not saying that a degree is necessarily important or not. I'm just saying the danger of not having a uh, standard in what, how we do our politics means that you will take whoever... But you know, don't popular. you see that then we can argue that the politicians are actually encouraging mm. this culture of mm. mediocrity? Right. But you, but but you only have one politician. For example, we have three hundred and forty-nine. No, people in no, 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 no. This person is not just a no, politician. No? When we elect this person, when we put this person in office, yes. we actually yes. elevate them. Not just like you said, we give them a role, and this is a leadership role. Now, but as, did you give him, Eric? It, it, which one? Whatever, did you give him? whatever expectations we had, when you get to that uh, caucus as leaders. And you're saying yes. this is what is happening. This is how come we get voted in, voted out all the time. We ought to have better standards as leaders. Then you start championing <laughs> those better standards. Or even, leaders, promote, or even promote, promote, promote those better standards. Even Say, even this I'm is not... what I want you to judge me on. Even at when the risk of losing your election, seat. Go and say, you know what, people? The last time I came and promised to do all the primary schools in Yerry Town. Listen, guys, I realized when I went to Parliament that, first of all, the only uh, capacity that I have to do that is using the influence of the CDF. But I don't have any other capacity to build schools. But this is what I have as a member of parliament. I can influence such that the national government can come and build schools. I can influence the budgetary allocation and I can influence policy direction. This is actually what I'd like us to do. Let's elevate. Judge me from this going forward. I want you people now, to judge me by this. Now, as you say that, mm. there'll be some other guy who wants your position. There always is some other guy. The same yeah, who will be telling people that no, 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 no. This the reason this guy is not building schools is because he's not he's able, incapable. not because he he's incapable. It is, has nothing to do with that uh, that he can, he doesn't have the money to do it. If I was in his office, I would be able to build schools, even if it means I use my own money. You understand? Yeah, and but it's because you've taken five business. years to come and explain this to me. If you're explaining no, this to me I'm, during I'm a, re a re-election campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. then you'll have a problem. If you've spent if the I last five years showing me the difference between what you promised, what you can deliver, and what you can then deliver using your position, use that position in those five years to show me I have influenced policy and now this is the path that we are taking. The schools in Yeri Town are going to improve in the next mm -hmm. 15 years because of the mm -hmm. policy that I've influenced in Parliament. Then now, by the time you're coming back to mm. me in five, in five years' time in the re-election campaign, I'll already be knowing what we are talking about. Also, the education of the public involves such procedures. You do something, you may even yeah. lose your seat. And all you require is somebody who will come in with a lovely story and nothing more. And they will realize that indeed they made a mistake. They will have learned because they will understand this was an honest, truthful man who told us what could actually happen what, and what couldn't. It doesn't stop you from being re-elected again. Mm. We have a lot of honest, truthful men who never actually get into office at all. Right, very Because true. unfortunately, they, they don't make it because Kenyans because have a problem. True. with Yes. Because you're not going to go and, and run for office and tell people that, you know, I can only do this much. Hmm. I can't do everything. You want to overpromise so that they get you in the seat. At they want least. to overpromise people. And now, some, I want to believe I'm part of the 30% that is hopefully going to come back. Mm. Why? Because I, I'm trying to deliver what I promised. I, for example, out of the 78 schools in Nyeri, so far we've done close to, we've done 48. And we still have two years to go. So I could actually be able to do all the schools using the NGCDF funds. And now because I'm a vice chair of the education committee, 
I'm able to also lobby for infrastructural money from the ministry. So I could actually do this. But I, we are, I want to consider myself an exception, as you said, because I actually tried to promise only what I knew could be, de- could be delivered because I understood the job I was going to do. And take. you got elected. Not too many. And you yes, got elected. I, I promised, for example, one of the promises I made, which people, don't, which I keep, people outside Nyeri don't understand, was that I promised the people of Nyeri I was going to mainstream Nyeri into, Nyeri into national politics. Now, that during a promise sounds very vague, but I have done it. Uh, so that was a strategy you know at that said? point. So you're not against... I have, I, you were not really speaking out against the deputy president. You were basically getting a platform no. for Nyeri. No, 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 no. It's, it's, two, it's twofold, uh, Eric. Mm. You see, what, what most politicians tend to do is not step out of the comfort zone. So you just operate within a certain comfort zone because in that comfort zone, you, you, you don't really stand out in either... You're not an extremist on either, on either side. So mine was, I will actually go out there and make sure that Nyeri's voice is heard every time national conversations are being held. And I have tried to do that as much as possible. And, and because of that, Nyeri is one of those places you invite the Nyeri member of parliament onto Spice FM because you know him. Hello? So if you're going to be prescriptive here, and we've talked about the fact yes. that you somebody's somebody to blame, putting in somebody mm-hmm. into government, and you know who this person is, you know who yes. he or she is, what would mm-hmm. you say that people ought to do? Especially when it comes to things like public participation, holding leaders yes. accountable, that then need to be put in place by an act of parliament. For example, how would that happen when it is hinged on the same leaders making it possible for people to come and lend their voice? Say that Which is actually what I was going to say. There's no way a, 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 a politician is going to pass a law trying to hold him into account. I mean, we have been struggling to, to, to just raise the academic level in parliament. And we are arguing that you don't have to, be, to have any academic uh, qualifications to be a leader. Which other job do we make that kind of argument? But somehow we actually allow that to pass. Mm. And, and it tells you that the reason, I, in my opinion, the people who employ politicians are the ones at fault. And this is why when I was talking about whose fault it is, is that today, if you're going to employ uh, someone to take, to take care of your house, mm. and you do not have an expectation of that person, meaning that any, the person who comes and tells you, I'm going to make sure your, your walls are white every day, well, you know that is not possible. But just because you like them or they look nice, and you actually give them the job, and then they don't do that, and in two, three months you fire them, and you hire somebody else. Before you hire in any job, you have a checklist. And in that checklist, you break down what you need, mm. except in politics. Gunjiru Mpogo, I think uh, one hour is a short time. We'll invite you again for a continuation of this conversation. Thank you very much for speaking to us this morning. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Gunjiru Mbogo is the MP for Nyeri Town. Asante Sana for joining us. This is a Situation Room. It's Kenya's biggest conversation. People of Nyeri, 90.9. In Malindi, 97.7. Eldoret, 96.7. 96.0. In Nakuru, Kisumu, 102.5. 87.9. In Mombasa, and 94.4. In Nairobi.